Welcome, everybody. Um, I was just saying to those of you that um, have just joined, um, we had a technical glitch. One of our speakers hasn't been able to join, so we're running a couple of minutes late. But we're going to kick off, and we're going to very much hope that that speaker can, can join us. So welcome to this session on citywide inclusive sanitation, a critical missing piece in climate policy and financing. My name is Martin Gambrell. I'm a lead water and sanitation specialist at the World Bank, and I'll be moderating this session. Please follow the usual webinar protocols, muting your microphone when not speaking, and please use the Pathable chat box to ask questions and make comments throughout, not the Zoom chat box. Our 60-minute session will comprise what we hope you'll find to be a set of compelling quick-fire presentations about the nexus of urban sanitation and climate change impact, policy and funding, followed by a panel discussion. I'm going to first hand the word over to my colleague, Miguel Vargas Ramirez, who is a lead water and sanitation specialist at the World Bank and the incoming lead of the bank's citywide inclusive sanitation initiative. Miguel will provide us with a brief overview of CWIS and the sanitation service chain. Over to you, Miguel. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Martin. Next. Here we can see a picture of the urban sanitation crisis. This is a global crisis since 50% of the world's population currently live in urban areas. Mostly these are low income and in lower middle income countries. This population, urban population is expected to grow from four to 6 billion by the year 2045. In cities around the world, even when there's pipe water, there's a, a big uh, gap in sewage and uh, sanitation services. In, uh, in different countries of the world, we can see different extremes. In Africa, in some Asian cities, we can see that some of the cities are only covered by sewage by 10% of the population, usually in the part that is planned central areas. In the other end of the scale, in rich uh, countries such as in Argentina, at the current rate of sewage expansion, it will take about 200 years to be able to cover everybody with sewage services. So what happened to the rest of the people? What happened to the rest of that 90% that don't have services? Well, they're generally, generally self-sufficient. They rely on self-provision, on-site sanitation, on their own sewage drainage systems. Then these services are generally unsafely managed and informally provided. Next. So citywide inclusive sanitation is uh, an initiative that they have, the bank has um, spearheaded with other uh, development partners to be able to include that 90%. And uh, some of the principle is a diversity of technical solutions that come together. And those technical solutions are both on-site and sewer sanitation, centralized and decentralized systems. I basically integrate all these technical solutions uh, with the financial institution and regulatory and social dimensions of urban sanitation. And the idea is also to harmonize all these solutions with urban development, urban services, such as water supply, drainage, and solid waste management. So we have been already um, embedding these principles of citywide inclusive sanitation in World Bank projects uh, with development partners. Next. Here we can see how the principles uh, of citywide inclusive sanitation can help us to think differently, including climate change. Uh, we can here have some example from around the world, how um, informal wastewater for irrigation is being uh, used in, and channeled in a, in a way that is formal and safe. Uh, just a couple of examples here at the, in the middle, we see the before and after an arid landscape in Cochabamba, Bolivia has been transformed in a lush green environment thanks to uh, the centralized treatment. At the top part of the picture, we see uh, the solution uh, where domestic wastewater is being transformed for industrial water use, saving a lot of money in a costly submarine of, uh, uh, outfall and also freeing up water resources for the city. So, so the sanitation sector can do a lot uh, towards addressing climate change. Next. However, we have to think beyond treatment and final disposal. Usually when we think about sanitation and climate change, we focus about fecal sludge management and wastewater uh, treatment. But we have to unbundle 
the whole sanitation uh, service change to be able to account for each one of those change um, towards a contribution for uh, green emission houses and how to do safe sanitation. So this is a very important part of these presentations where all of these change on the sanitation uh, links will be analyzed and will be discussed for um, and their impact on global um, emissions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Miguel, um, for setting the scene for us on the urban sanitation imperative on citywide inclusive sanitation and the sanitation service chain. We're now going to hear from Nate Engel, who's a senior climate change specialist with the World Bank's Water Global Practice, where he works to mainstream climate change into bank water sector investments. Nate will present to us on systematically analyzing GHG emissions from urban sanitation systems. Over to you, Nate. Thanks so much, Martin. And um, so I'm just, I know we're running a little behind, so I'm just gonna jump right in. If you go to the next slide, please. So as Martin mentioned, I'm gonna talk about what we're doing here at the World Bank uh, to think about how to measure and evaluate uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the sanitation chain. Now, the, the, the take home message here is that it's a very challenging endeavor. Um, it's complex. There's no uh, one size fits all solution. And uh, it's very dependent upon the context and the technology. But we do know a few things about greenhouse gas emissions when it comes to, 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 to sanitation. First is that water and wastewater plants in, in particular are extremely high uh, consumers of electricity. So for municipalities, it's often the, the greatest consumer. And even in some of the countries, it's the greatest consumer of electricity. So um, that's one thing we know. Another is that methane and nitrous oxide, which have a, high, a much higher global warming potential than carbon dioxide, upwards of, um, for methane, it's uh, up to 35 times as much, and for uh, nitrous oxide, even close to 300 times as much, um, that these are important uh, emissions that are, that are produced from excreta and sanitation systems. And then you have, of course, methane that's associated with pit latrines and septic tanks. Uh, next, please. So this is just a depiction, um, a schematic, just showing, you know, uh, where in the sanitation chain emissions for greenhouse gases, greenhouse gas emissions tend to uh, take place. And you can see, you know, there, there are a couple of activities that contribute to this. And when I'm talking about emissions, again, we're talking about direct emissions from methane, CO2, and uh, nitrous oxide, uh, and indirect emissions from carbon dioxide. Next, please. So what we're doing here at the World Bank, and um, I think it's becoming more common practice across other uh, development banks and institutions is to account for greenhouse gas emissions within these types of activities. So we are required to do this at the World Bank for all of the infrastructure intensive sectors, such as water, transportation, uh, and so on. And we developed this tool called the Greenhouse Gas Accounting Tool for Water, a pretty basic term, basic name, but it does a lot. And it's, like a, it's an Excel-based tool. And this is just showing you a snapshot of um, the sanitation or, or the, the wastewater utility uh, module of that tool. But this really helps to tease out where the emissions are taking place um, in an activity or a project and compare it to a baseline to understand what the greenhouse gas emissions will be over the lifetime of the project. Next, please. And when you do that, you start to get numbers like this. So you can tease out where the breakdown of the emissions are. So here, for example, is a conventional sewerage system where you see most of the emissions are taking place with, with respect to treatment and collection. Next, please. But we need to be able to do it even more nuanced view on this uh, to be able to compare different technologies, to be able to compare the trade-offs and opportunities. And that's why the Citywide Inclusive Sanitation Program is developing a greenhouse gas emissions estimation tool. And these are the assumptions that are carrying forward in the next few examples that I'm going to show you a couple of scenarios just to show where how complex this is and how the tr there are various trade-offs between the different activities and technologies. Next, please. So the first one is taking a conventional sewer, secondary treatment, sludge digestion system, where the emissions for methane are allowing to escape to open air. You can see most of the emissions are, are methane and nitrous oxide coming from treatment. Next, please. But if you take the same system and then do um, methane combustion, you can see those methane emissions shrink drastically. Next, please. And you can see here even an additional sh um, shrinkage on that treatment if you do methane combustion and recovery. So thinking back to what Miguel was just saying, I'm um, thinking and bringing in circular economy approaches as well. Next, please. Shifting over to 
a completely different approach, pit latrines with no fecal sludge removal and management. You can see the, uh, the emissions shift over. There's still methane, but they shift over predominantly to the um, containment and interface. Next, please. OK, let's build in fecal sludge management to this. You can see there's some, in, some direct and indirect emissions from collection, conveyance, and treatment associated with CO2. Next, please. This is the last example um, using urine di di uh, diverting toilets or container-based sanitation. You can see there are some benefits to this, but there are also still some areas where uh, emissions take place within the sanitation chain. Next, please. So this is the comparison of all of these. And it's not arguing for one technology over another. It's just trying to show that there are differences and there are, there are, are nuances and trade-offs to this. So final slide, please. The take home message again is that we need to think about, as Miguel was saying, the sanitation system, not just one treatment plant um, per se. And another really important message is that when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions reductions, all sanitation systems can be improved and should be improved. And there are various ways of doing it. For saving time, I won't repeat them, but on the bullets there are some of the highlights for where these, um, where these improvements can be made. And last but not least, I can't emphasize enough you know, the old adage that you can't manage that which you do not measure. This is very important. So having tools like the ones that are under development that I mentioned, um, and also the ones you'll hear about later from other presenters are really important to be able to unpack where these emissions are coming from so that we can actually tackle them through our activities and our investments. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. Uh, thanks for clearly laying out the intricacies of understanding direct and direct indirect GHG emissions from different sanitation systems. Um, for our, um, those of you joining us, please remember, if you want to post any questions or comments for Nate or Miguel in the chat box, do that in the pathable chat box. Thanks. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Professor Barbara Evans of the University of Leeds, who will be providing us with some concrete examples of the interface between climate change and urban sanitation. Barbara holds the chair in public health engineering in the School of Civil Engineering at the University of Leeds. She leads a multidisciplinary team that works on sanitation, hygiene and water services with a particular focus on urban sanitation. Over to you, Barbara. Thanks very much, Martin. While I can still see you, could you give me a thumbs up because I'm having some tech problems? Oh, good, because uh, I'm, I'm working from my phone. Uh, so I just wanted to talk about a concrete example, really drawing, following on from Nate. Um, we were very interested to work out whether we could estimate the extent of greenhouse gas emissions. And as part of uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates funded uh, Cactus Project and the uh, NERC and UK government funded High Crystal Project, we worked in Kampala to do this. So next slide, please. Uh, we were really interested to look at the actual sanitation system for the whole of Kampala city and estimate the greenhouse gas emissions from three sources, direct emissions from the sludges and, and wastewater that's in the system, operational emissions from trucking waste and for pumping and aeration and embedded carbon. And we wanted to do that along the whole value chain just to try and assess whether this is significant. Um, we used Kampala and here's the uh, ship flow diagram for Kampala, um, which shows a very typical uh, low income city, very relatively well managed, I have to say, I mean, that's always a pleasure to be working in Kampala, some on site systems some off site systems, uh, no container based sanitation as yet. Some of the on site systems work well, some of the wastewater is leaking and some of the uh, some of the on site systems work well and some, there's quite a lot of leakage. Um, there's some pictures here. Sorry, next, Nishta. I'm sorry, there's some uh, timings on these slides. Um, so very typical systems, uh, a lot of problems with flooding, lots of direct connections to drainage, particularly during flood events. Next slide, please. Uh, so we essentially were interested in a whole range of things. One important thing that we did was that we developed new models for the emissions rates from actual toilets in Kampala based on physical observations of what types of sludges are in those toilets and how they function under different conditions. So we were really interested in understanding how things varied depending on levels of groundwater and flooding. We also had some fantastic data on how many truck trips are taken because we expected operational emissions to be very significant, significant because there's a lot of emptying. But if we go to the next slide, um, 
what we can see is that on the left here, we can see the total um, e emissions profiles in uh, kilograms of CO2 equivalent. Sorry, the uh, Y axis is incorrectly labeled. That's a terrible failure by a professor uh, per capita per year for systems. And going from left to right for the on site systems, uh, these are increasingly well managed. So the irony of something that Nate is saying is that better management in some cases results in higher emissions if you're taking sludge to treatment and not capturing the methane if you have anaerobic treatment. But also what we see is that there are very high per capita rates of emissions associated with all of the flows which go into the drainage network and which are dumped. We map that across the whole sanitation uh, value chain using the ship flow diagram. And you can see on the left of this slide, a very big uh, black blob, which is essentially, as Nate said, all the emissions from the fecal sludge, which stays in the pit latrines. And on the right hand side, you can see quite a lot of two big black blobs, sorry, just go back, um, two black blobs, which are associated with treatment. But you can also see all of the flows which are going into the environment are also resulting in a lot of direct, particularly methane emissions, because we have wet drainage uh, dumping going on. Um, we looked at how significant this was. Uh, we mapped this against, thanks, uh, Nishta, next slide. Um, this is a, an assessment of the, the sort of portfolio of emissions from the city of Kampala. And you can see that the standard estimate has sanitation contributing about 25% of total city emissions. But when we, in, when we sort of um, updated these numbers and then put our estimate in, we think that uh, the estimates for sanitation are low and that probably they're accounting for somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of total city emissions. So this is not insignificant. Taking overall take home messages, we're definitely underestimating total emissions from sanitation. The IPCC acknowledged this. There's, the methods are not robust enough yet. The main issues, as Nate said, relate to anaerobic storage and anaerobic treatment without any methane capture. Um, what can we do about it? Primarily improved active management. Um, aerobic systems do tend to work better, and this speaks to the question that was in the chat about container-based sanitation. I think container-based sanitation will look quite good because generally, or quite often, container-based systems are aerobic, and the container-based system is moving the sludge and treating it quickly through the system. So if there's one take-home message for me, it's that if we want to manage um, uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, then we've really got to invest in active, effective management and monitoring of existing systems. Back to you, Martin. Thanks so much, Barbara. Excellent. Some very important and thought-provoking work on, on, on how we approach sanitation service chains generally. Yeah, and, 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 this, and your practical system management suggestions of how we can overcome some of these challenges. Great. Again, please carry, um, carry on using the, the chat box, the pathable chat box, where there's a nice um, amount of discussion going on there. We've got two more presentations for you, then the panel discussion. We'll now hear from Dr. Sarah Dickin, who's a research fellow at the Stockholm Environment Institute, and who'll present some of the sanitation gap findings in glo global climate policy and financing that she identified in her recently published work. Sarah is a health geographer working at SEI on the topics at the intersection of environment, development, and human well-being. Over to you, Sarah. Great, thank you. Um, and hi, everyone from Stockholm this evening. Um, thanks for the invitation to share my perspective on this issue. I'm gonna be talking about the gaps relating to climate policy, and I'll highlight a few issues related to the nationally determined contributions as well as climate finance. Um, so we've already seen how it's really important to think about sanitation when it comes to mitigation. The emissions are actually significant. Um, so the question is, how is this being addressed in climate policy? Um, so many of you know about the nationally determined contributions, um, and these are voluntary commitments for emissions reductions um, taken by countries. Um, and all countries are expected to deliver these, and they outline the steps that countries um, are taking at a national level to reduce emissions and as well as some other actions like adaptation. Um, so to look at this further, we used SCI's SDG NDC connections tool this is together with some colleagues um, at SCI as well as CUE. Um, and this tool breaks down the NDCs into concrete activities, so not just references, um, and maps them to the SDG goals and targets. Um, so using this tool, we saw that water is considered one of the top five vulnerable sectors um, to climate change. 
um, but there's actually very um, limited concrete information on um, sanitation. Um, so if you could go back uh, one slide, please. Um, so we can look at this on the, the figure on the left. Um, you can see that almost 10% of NDC activities were mapped to SGG6. Um, but then when we zoom in, um, which is shown on, on the figure on the right, we can see that actually of these NDC activities, only 2% were actually related to sanitation and 3% were related to wastewater. And actually a majority of these were adaptation activities, not mitigation activities. Uh, so we can really see here the gaps in how um, sanitation is included in the NDCs. And we can break it down further by geographical location. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we can see here on the right, for example, that most activities uh, were reported by lower and middle income countries. And then on the left, you can see that the Middle East and North Africa region um, and Sub-Saharan Africa region actually reported the most activities. I um, mean, this could be due to extensive experience with wastewater reuse in um, the MENA region or water scarcity in both of these regions. Um, but we can see that they, are, they have been recognized in the NDCs. Um, but importantly, there were no sanitation uh, related mitigation activities reported by the USA, Indonesia, China, or India. And this is despite the fact that these countries uh, contribute to a large proportion of methane emissions, um, as well as nitrous oxide emissions from wastewater. Um, so we can see overall that sanitation is really not well included in the NDCs. So I wanna look at this from another issue, which is relating to climate finance. Um, so next slide, please. So climate finance offers a really good opportunity for sanitation related climate action. Um, but it has been quite limited so far. Um, so there are a number of forms of climate finance. Uh, we look specifically at project uh, proposals approved by the Green Climate Fund. Um, and this was including up to 2019. So there are a few more projects since then. Um, but we looked at projects that uh, were focused on sanitation and wastewater, and we found really only a few. These were all part of larger water programs as well. So they weren't specific to sanitation. And of these projects, uh, of the ones that had specific budget lines on sanitation, these were mostly co-financed by other funders. Um, so only around 1 million US dollars was actually coming from the Green Climate Fund. Um, and this is actually a, a drop in the bucket compared to the overall budget for these approved projects. Um, so the main takeaway here is that uh, there's limited inclusion of sanitation in the NDCs and climate policy. And this suggests that decision makers, um, they really don't see a role for sanitation and climate action at the moment, um, or they have limited evidence of the linkages that we've seen here today. Um, so overall, it's really important to increase awareness among decision makers of these issues, um, as well as strengthening policy in this area. So thanks very much. Thank you, Sarah. Um increasing awareness great and hopefully we're, we're we're adding to that awareness here um we see there's much to do to ensure that sanitation takes its rightful place in leveraging climate funding and influencing climate policy again please continue to use the chat box if you have any um, observations or questions for sarah last but not least of our espresso presentations we'll hear from natalie and natalie andre who's a specialist in sanitation policy solutions based at the global green growth institute in Searle and is the Community of Practice co-lead for waste focusing on liquid waste and sanitation, where she provides support and guidance to GGGI offices for transformative sanitation related projects. Natalie will present for us on accessing global climate funding and technical assistance. Over to you, Natalie. So thank you, Martin, and hello everyone from Seoul. Um, so GGI uh, has offers in over 30 member countries where we offer support um, in a wide range of development issues and one of them is in sanitation and in sanitation we've specifically been focusing on secondary cities and and on-site uh, sanitation and bringing the climate angle and finance um, which is where i'm i'm going to talk a little bit about accessing global climate funding and technical assistance for sanitation next please 
So as Sarah mentioned, um, there's very little climate financing for sanitation. Um, so this is a diagram from a recent CPI report. So the total climate financing um, is around 600 billion. Um, if we look at where sanitation fits in, it fits under water and waste, um, and it's 13, accounts for 13 out of the just under 600 billion. So we're talking about less than 2%, and most of it's from DFIs and in concept of adaptation. Over, next please. So in view of financing needs, why is there so little uh, climate financing? Um, so if you could do a few actually, just a few thoughts, yeah. Um, so as Sarah mentioned, um, NDCs are, are one of the climate's um, main national policies. Um, and there's an, and there needs to be alignment with these national policies. Um, with, so with the NDCs and the National Adaptation Plan. If you could do next one, one more, sorry. Yeah. Um, so they fo the NDCs focus ma mainly on mitigation targets or, or adaptation targets. Um, so sanitation is actually included under the waste category for mitigation targets. And if we look at um, Africa um, and we look at the targets for waste, most of them are quite gen generic. Um, and there's only very few that are actually for wastewater. So all of this um, is basically to say that climate financing, it often looks for alignment with national policies and plans. And right now it's not finding it. And next. Um, and likewise for adaptation plans, um, sanitation is only superficially included. Next. Next, a few actually, yeah, thanks. Um, so what are the requirements for climate financing? So from our experience trying to support our countries, member countries in, in obtaining climate financing for sanitation, um, we've realized there's maybe one key takeaway learning message, which is that climate um, financing is not development financing. So it's really looking at financing initiatives where there's a clear climate change um, um, impact that it can resolve through, through the initiative. Um, and that can be for mitigation, adaptation, but also environmental and economic social co-benefits. Um, there are also another series of criteria that it has to fulfill, um, which is more straightforward for sanitation, um, though these are quite, uh, they take some time in putting together a, a cohesive argument. So sustainable development potential, the needs of the recipient, the paradigm shift potential, and then the efficiency and the um, effectiveness and financial viability. So on this last point, um, the financial viability, uh, this is, this is an, a known issue for sanitation. Um, it, it's hard to make these, these projects viable. And I have to say that climate finance is particular risk averse. And so there needs this, this climate, this uh, financial viability really needs to be addressed. Um, so the main challenges that we've encountered is that climate arguments are not formally established for climate finance um, and that these arguments require considerable data. So um, as Sarah mentioned, the GCF, it follows the IPCC guidance where, where actually there needs to be modeling based on data, if possible, in 30 years. Another issue that we found for on-site sanitation projects is that they're generally small and that um, to put together these projects for climate financing actually takes, uh, is quite costly um, in terms of data collection and just getting enough people to, to get the proposal together. Um, and these projects are not applicable for small projects, um, financial, uh, the, SAP, the SAP financing facility. And uh, I'm gonna emphasize again, the financial viability of sanitation projects, it really is, a real challenge. Next. So I'm going to conclude on where we feel that technical assistance is needed. So there needs to be common agreement on mitigation adaptation benefits with climate related metrics for sanitation projects as laid out by our colleagues before, Barbara and Nathan and Sarah, and um, dissemination of these metrics and benefits to mainstream sanitation into climate finance. So in my first slide, I, I showed that climate finance, actually, there's a large part which is private, and we need to try and tap into this. 
And lastly, especially for um, on-site sanitation projects, we need to develop pipelines of pooled sanitation projects or combine them with other infrastructure to increase the size of investment and attract financiers. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Natalie. Um, you've laid out a lot of challenges for, the, for us there. And this issue of, of the, the, the financial viability of sanitation projects is something that we we struggle with um, irrespective of climate change, but you, you laid out a lot of the challenges perhaps that we that we need to um, we need to confront, we need to address if we're to move um, sanitation where it needs to be within the climate funding and policy arena. So we'll now have a panel discussion, having heard all that with our presenters. Um, we've got some questions lined up for them, but we'll also draw on your questions and comments you've put in the pathable chat box i i hope that the presenters will also be looking i, I see that some of them are and, and, and responding to those i'm going to kick it off with a question for barbara about uh, whether there's any evidence um barbara that one particular and obviously you've touched on a lot of this but whether one particular mode of sanitation um service is better than others in terms of ghg emissions um and while you're doing that i'm going to have a look at the um while you're answering that i'll have a look at the pathable chat yeah, great. No, it's a top question. Um, I think it's very context specific. I'm going to say a very mealy mouth thing and say it's quite context specific. And I think it's dependent on a whole range of things. So just as an example, one of the things we found in Kampala is that the emissions from trucking waste are not significant. But if you had really well managed um, on site sanitation that was regularly emptied, and really good treatment, then probably the, the trucking would become more important. And you might start to get to the point where you might think in some cases, pipes might look better than trucks or trucks might look better than pipes. And that would depend hugely on the, the geography, the layout of the city, the efficiency of the transport network. So I would personally always say, let's avoid saying one is better than the other and let's get an understanding of the greenhouse gas emission attributes of each type of sanitation approach, because there are so many other reasons why you might make choices about the technology as well. So I think it's a lot more about being explicit and clear. Um, and the one thing I would say that is always good, always good, is to have plenty of money to make sure. I mean, it sounds so silly, doesn't it? But if you have to use pumping or trucks, let's make sure that everything is properly lubricated, that it's properly managed, that we're running all of our systems at the highest possible efficiency, because all those losses become you know, quite a big problem within the system. So no, I don't think that there's one system which is better than another system per se, but I think you would make that choice in the context that you would choose to make it. Excellent, as we should be doing with sanitation systems in any case, mm -hmm. whether it's for the environmental yeah. or the the public health or the or the service um, um, perspectives. Thanks for that. I'm I'm going to bring a, a question to Sarah and Nate. So I'm going to leave them with a question and then give them a couple of minutes to think about it while I look at some of the um, read some of the chat in the pathable chat box. The question is: As we've seen, data availability is a huge gap at the intersection of sanitation systems and climate change. How can we improve this situation? If Sarah and Nate can think about that a little bit, I'm just going to um, mention a couple of the um, things that I've seen in the in the chat box as well. Um, from John Lane, inspiring session. Next step, we must use your strong scientific findings to promote sanitation as a tool to help politicians achieve their net zero targets. There's a couple of really good observations, um, comments by Monica Vebafar as well. Um, her first one I liked was about and it can be a question that the, that the panel can think about as well. Now I've lost it, let me find it. When will, <laughs> we, when will we be able to start estimating the potential income flows from reducing GHG emissions? That's a great question. Okay, Sarah, what do you think of the data? And maybe that is linked to it as well, the income flows issue that we're mentioning here. Yeah, thanks. So I guess um, the easy answer is that more research is needed on this, but I think actually uh, we're starting to see a bit of the raising of awareness of this issue among um, decision, decision makers, um, people working in the sector, actually. So I think it's, we don't, even with climate change, we often talk about how we don't need to wait for the absolute best possible data before um, taking action. So I think what's important is that we already start communicating some of these messages and building awareness so that we do get um, increased uh, opportunities for funding and more research and we kind of uh, build up some some critical mass on this issue. So that would be my, my first thought. Thanks, if I could, Sarah. If I could add yeah, to please. that. Yeah. yeah. 
So I think that um, one of the one of the good things that comes from something like what I was mentioning that the, the World Bank requires now and a lot of other multilateral development banks require greenhouse gas accounting for projects, I think that that demand on the side of, um, of, an, of a development institution that needs to collect that data um, and the more of, of, of those sorts of demands on countries to get the data, I think, signal that that's important to keep tracking. And I think that you know the, when we get into the, when we have projects and we have our first mission and we go and talk with clients about this, oftentimes they don't know where to get the data or they may not have it but you dig a little deeper, it becomes, you know, you know, it surfaces. And if it's not there, you know, it's a signal to start collecting it if it's not. So we were starting, you have to start somewhere. And I think that even asking the questions in all of our projects, in all of these investments is a really critical start. And then in terms of kind of um, getting, the, getting the, the, the dollar amount or getting some um, dollar to the flows of the greenhouse gas emissions reductions, I think this is where you you know we'll, we'll start to see more around results based financing so that if you know we have a project that is 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 intending to reduce greenhouse gas emissions that's a sanitation project um, and it, it it does that you can you can put a dollar value to that you can actually use the um, emissions uh, credits or you know you, you can get um, uh, some sort of social impact investing and. Um, even development finance, like our institution, does that sort of investment so that you can start to put the dollar value on those results. I think we'll see more of that. Thanks, Nate. Um, my next question is for Natalie. I've just seen that she's been having trouble. She's not able to see the pathable chat, which is a shame. Um, Natalie, the question I'm going to ask you, I'll, I'll ask a question. I'm, I'm then going to go to the, while you're thinking about it, there's, a, there's another question for you in the chat that I'll read out. Um, and then I'll come back for your response. For the sanitation sector, wastewater treatment plants are often able to attract private and climate finance. How do you think we can change things so we can better access climate financing for other parts of the service chain and for other sanitation systems? And I know you've made some reference to that, but maybe you've got some other ideas. And while you're thinking about that, I will just quickly, there was a question. Um, Martin, from... could, I, could I jump in? Yeah. Sorry. I just wanted to say one thing on this climate finance question that I think is going to be a huge challenge. Um, and actually your comment about output based and results based financing is very important because I think we've struggled for so long in sanitation. Most of the things we need to do, I mean, yes, we can build tech and getting uh, finance for building infrastructure is one thing and we can think about that. But actually what we really need is results based financing to incentivize really good active management and it's expensive and I think you know we've got to bear in mind that over the lifetime of a sanitation system you might spend 80% of the money on the operational cost not the not the investment cost so just want to I know you would say the same thing but I just want to really really hammer this point home that the big the big win is in being innovative in incentivizing good management rather than just building more stuff would be excellent, my take. excellent point Barbara not only 80% of the costs are in o &M, the problem is 80% of our efforts are in constructing it, maybe. I'm obviously yeah. just using your number and 20% of, of, of the attention is then given to the actual sustainable running of the system. So a really, really important point. Thank you for that. Natalie, um, one of the questions from Monica was whether your data was from GGGI or CPI. Um, and maybe you could just have a... Uh, um, have so a on, the, on, the first, on the first slide, it was uh, from CPI. Um, the, the rest is from GGGI. D to your point about the other parts of the chain, um, so it's something that we've been looking to do in Senegal, uh, for instance, um, and, and there we've been looking at uh, guarantees, uh, guarantees for, for SMEs and so on to be able to take out loans. Um, and, uh, but these are for viable elements of the chain where they're likely to get loans because they're viable. So I, I'm just going to stress on this viability. And at some point, um, it does maybe require subsidy, which, which I think, as Barbara suggested, as a results-based subsidy, I think would be would be great. Um, but I think when we've gone to countries, they just had the hope that oh, there's all this climate financing, and it doesn't know where to go. Please come here. But but it's it still needs to be viable and it's not development finance so it, it's not that easy that we're just going to fill gaps with this climate financing um 
And, and as for the, the climate financing going for wastewater treatment works and so on, there's still very little, very little because these climate arguments are not clear. It has gone for maybe flood mitigation measures, um, which, is, which is a clearer um, element, but very little has actually gone for inf sanitation infrastructure per se. Yeah, over. Thanks, Natalie. Um, I was going to ask a question about the enablers in the sanitation sector for cities to mobilize climate financing and harness its full potential. And I was going to ask each of the presenters about that. So think about that. And then I'm going to add to that Brian Arbogast's um, comment question in the, in the chat. Do any of the presenters have examples of cities doing a good job of including sanitation considerations into their own climate adaptation resiliency plans, i.e. good um, any exemplars or good case studies? So, um, and I notice while you're thinking about that, that um, David Schwab Jones mentions that he's part of a team working on climate change and sanitation in Mozambique, and Beira has some interesting things to share. Maybe some of the panel are familiar with that case. I'm not sure if you are or not, but let me go round and um, let's hear from Sarah first. Um, so something that I wanted to mention more broadly than just um, a city focus is that I think one, one risk is actually that we're leaving certain countries behind. Um, so we're talking about the need for data and also for um, countries, the viability for countries to put together some of these proposals. So I think um, something to think about in terms of enabling climate finance is how we can also support the least developed countries. Um, because when we talk about sanitation, we're really thinking about um, the most vulnerable people and really providing very basic services. So I think there's there's potentially a risk here where uh, countries that have the, the uh, more access to data and also more capacity and also more resources to put together proposals um, are the ones that will be able to address this, whereas other countries that maybe don't have that capacity um, won't actually be able to put together proposals, even if they actually do have a, a greater need for sanitation and a greater, they can make more use of um, sanitation climate finance. So um, that's something I want to point out. I'm not sure if it's really an enabler, but um, if we want to enable uh, climate finance for climate action, we really need to think about not just kind of the low hanging fruit, but also how we're going to support um, countries that really need this, um, who but don't have these, these uh, resources. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Natalie, any thoughts in that regard? Oh, no, I no. sorry. I I was actually I've discovered the chat and I was actually busy reading the chat. Oh, um, <laughs> uh, so I I'm afraid I didn't hear the question, but I did see some other questions. One of them from Russian from the Gates Foundation, which I salute as um, we're also alive thanks to them. Um, I I wanted to say. So about the research, there's a lot going on, but I don't think there's consolidated metrics agreed with climate financiers. We haven't had that final together, let's agree on what, what works for sanitation in terms of climate links and what is, that there's one part which is academic, um, but we need to bring that into the climate financiers and, and, and have them agree. Um, and I think stakeholders like such as everyone on the panel here from the World Bank and from SEA and, and from Leeds, uh, stakeholders like that coming together with climate financiers to, to agree on, on what would be okay for, for climate financing would, would be a way forward. Thanks. Thanks, Natalie. Um, Barbara, any thoughts on, on examples? And then I'll come to you, Nate. And then we'll probably have one more round of questions. I'm sorry, I was so distracted by, by Natalie's question. I've now forgotten an answer. I've now forgotten the question. Tell good, me the question. Good examples of cities where you've seen it happen. Um, uh, we have resilience plans and we have maybe climate yeah. financing built into our urban sanitation yeah. planning. So, no, I, I have to say I'm, I'm not seeing it. And I think, as, as everyone's been saying, I, th I don't think the link has yet been made as strongly as it could be made. And I do think we need to do that. And I one thing I want to say is that I think we would be advised to make a, a combined case for this, not just on the mitigation argument that good managed, well managed sanitation, well badly managed sanitation could lead to a lot of emissions, so we should invest in managing it well. But we should also bear in mind that a really resilient sanitation system is part of your resilient city to other shocks. 
So, you know, if you're, as you know, there's some other work which we're going to present later in the week about the, the intersection of flooding and sanitation. If you have really badly managed sanitation systems and you're coping up in floods, you're basically filling your environment with fecal waste, which is a massive public health hazard, and probably washing a load of nutrients into a, you know, delicate water body or whatever. So I think we should be packaging both the mitigation and the resilience argument uh, or mitigation and adaptation and resilience arguments together when we go to financing. And if Natalie can organise that meeting with finances, <laughs> I'm very happy to give my time. That's excellent, Barbara. And uh, as I always like to say, sanitation, the beauty of sanitation, it touches on so much in development and city development. But the curse of sanitation is it, that it touches on everything and we can fall between the gaps. And your, your message on on well-managed systems is so important, as I said before, not only for the climate emissions and the, the greenhouse gas emissions, but for the environmental impact, for the public health and for the basic services for everyone. We've got to get that right. And it's about time we did. Maybe this is another opportunity for us to make that happen. Um, Nate, any thoughts on that? Well, um, yes. please. Yes, no, no, I'm so, that's music to my ears, Barbara, because I, I couldn't agree more that this, you know, we need to get past this false dichotomy of adaptation and resilience versus mitigation because it just really does a disservice because you cannot adequately con compare and consider the trade-offs and synergies between them if, if you're constantly just looking at it with one lens. And I think that um, I think that the, you know this is a really great example of a, of a sector where there's a lot of potential opportunity or harm if you don't do it the right way, if you're not looking at them together. But to answer your question about um, I, th I thought the question actually, and I wrote down some notes, was how can cities access climate finance? That was another one of the questions. And I wanted to su just suggest maybe reframing that or maybe turning it on its head a little bit and think more about how countries can leverage the impact that cities can have on greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Because I think they're a real resource that can help to contribute to their national goals. Like I said in, the, in, in, in my brief presentation, you know, municipalities and cities are oftentimes the largest electricity consumer. So, you know, this is for water supply, but also sanitation. So I think that, you know, what we're trying to do more and more, and I think that every single one of our projects should do this, um, but we should have an energy audit that precedes our, our investments to be able to understand where those key areas are to leverage. Um, and then that leads to greenhouse gas emiss emissions reductions. And I think then you can really access climate finance. So. I think that that use the cities as the as a, as a big motivator for um, greenhouse gas goals more largely for the country. Thanks, Nate. I'm going to read out a comment by Yam Willem. Um, hi, Yam Willem. Uh, WHO is about to publish version two of the sanitation safety planning manual, which includes climate considerations, which that's good to know. It includes tables with costs of changes to reduce risks. With climate being a specific risk, the approach should allow service providers and others to figure out the cost of making sanitation services more climate resilient. Linking this to climate finance should open an interesting door, which is uh, another angle to look at this from. Thanks for that. And um, I see that Sarah uh, um, has a question for Natalie, in fact, who may not be reading her pathable <laughs> chat still. So Natalie, is there any way of overcoming the development climate mitigation divide? Um, in terms of the argument of reducing vulnerability? Yeah, so um, coming from the climate financier perspective, um, I wouldn't say there needs to be a divide. Um, the, the climate finance is looking to finance adaptation a lot more. Um, its portfolio is quite weak right now, so it's looking to, to finance adaptation. Um, but if it can get some mitigation elements in, then it will. So it, it doesn't it doesn't go oh only and mitigation or only adaptation. I think from their perspective, there doesn't need to be a divide. Um, I think maybe what can happen is 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 and I think some of um, Barbara and, and others studies is looking at is is maybe some some. Uh, mitigation, ele some elements that may emit more GHG gases actually may be less resilient and then maybe there's some some kind of compromise to be had. But um, on from a climate finance perspective, I don't think that they're not against one each other. And, and, and in fact, I think it's all the better if there's both mitigation and adaptation elements. I hope I've answered that. 
Thanks, Thanks Natalie. And there's an observation from Norma Dishu about a um, very good presentation, encouraged to re re reducing GHG to be included in legislation and regulation of the country. So the whole policy regulation and legislative um, framework or incentives for financing projects for the reuse of greenhouse, which is going back to what Barbara said earlier about results-based financing, which I think is a very important point. And there's a question for the panel. This will probably be our last question. Um, I'll see how we're doing on time, but from Haroon Dawood, what is the panel's perspective on carbon credit-based climate financing? Are there any good examples of where this has been successfully implemented in the sanitation sector? Does anyone want to take that question? Does anyone? have an example or any knowledge on that. Lots of heads being sh shaken. So that's something <laughs> we, we, sh we should think about. Thank you for that. What I'm gonna do with the last round of questions, um, based on what we've heard today, what do the panelists think should come next for those of us in the sanitation sector wanting to leverage the momentous climate change moment that we're living through? So I'm gonna just, give each of you your sort of 30 second, you know, your marching orders for us. Let's go to Barbara first. Uh, so marching orders, don't, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. So let's not suddenly start wringing our hands and say sanitation's a big emitter. And that would be a, you know, that, that carries a hazard as well. So I think we need to be smart about saying we can optimize this situation. We can optimize systems and we can use the science to do that rather than oh my goodness, sanitation emissions are bigger than we thought because that's going to scare a lot of people off. So kind of positive and proactive with the, with the science that we have. And I'm going to try and do that. Excellent. Thanks, Barbara. Um, Sarah? Um, so since I talked about the NDCs, I think this is an important area to address to make sure that countries have the right information. And we've heard that it is also very context specific. So, um, you know, it's not going to be something general or globally applicable, but um, the countries have enough information that they can actually um, improve their next round of NDCs because this is a process that's iterative and, and ongoing. So there are um, opportunities to actually address some of these gaps that uh, I highlighted today. Excellent. Natalie. Thanks, Martin. So I'm going to uh, ask again, kind of for a lobby group to be created <laughs> um, uh, to get these climate arguments for sanitation across, um, because I think it can't be a one man show. I think there needs to be a good few people in the room. And there are many brains out there um, working on this and it would be good to to get some climate financing to sanitation because it's sorely needed and and also because it really is genuinely one of the best measures to protect water resources so um, yes please join we hear you that's a call to action Natalie that's great <laughs> we need a lobby we need a lobby group of of, of like-minded and others we can crowd into this to to move this agenda forward thank you for that Miguel any thoughts I think that data is one of key element, no? To start collecting data, to work with the projects, to be, to make use of all the GSG accountability tools and others that the partners have developed to start collecting the information, the evidence to make uh, the case of a strong linkage between sanitation and climate change. Thanks, Miguel. Yeah, we heard a lot about data today. That's really important. We need to start getting the numbers and showing the numbers and, and using that for the advocacy that others have talked about as well. Nate. So yeah, I, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, not much more to add other than that not, even though I was a big proponent today of, of measuring and getting data, I don't think we can let that paralyze us, you know, the absence of it, because I think there is enough information out there to make the case. And like Barbara said, it's about making a case that is not, um, a, a negative one, it's more about the opportunity that exists and that we know it exists. It's just about making sure that narrative sticks. Excellent. Well, thank you all um, the, for the panel um, I'm, um, and for an excellent discussion. And for those of you that have been discussing in the chat box as well, that's been, it's been really appreciated, it's been very rich. I'm, turn, I'm gonna turn now to um, my, my boss, my manager, uh, for some closing thoughts and takeaways from this session. I'm very pleased to introduce Maria Angelica Sotomayor. She's the practice manager for the World Bank's Heart of Africa unit, but she also manages um, globally our citywide inclusive sanitation initiative. So Maria Angelica, some, um, some of your takeaway thoughts for, for us. Thank you. 
Thank you, Martin. And thank you, everyone. Please join me in thanking the speakers, the partners, the CWIS team, and uh, all of you that joined the chat. I think this was an excellent uh, session. Um, some uh, key takeaways, I think, that, that uh, we need to keep in mind. Uh, first, sanitation is often missed or excluded from the national assessment of climate change impacts. And uh, this is something that we need to work on uh, collectively with those that are um, a, critically uh, responsible for doing those and having not just water, but sanitation. Um, attention to the emissions uh, from sanitation systems uh, mostly have been on centralized treatment plants. However, on site sanitation technologies that, such as uh, septic tanks and pit latrines are also sources of emissions, uh, but uh, remain poorly quantified. And this would be important if we think about India, for example, where if we were providing sanitation to 800 million people uh, through pit latrines, that will cost to increase India's annual GHG emission equivalent uh, to about 7% of current levels. We heard from Barbara that we need to make sure that the operation and maintenance of the systems uh, are something that we pay particular attention to. And this would be critical um, when we think about uh, new solutions uh, that we are going to finance. Um, as countries expand their sanitation systems and treatment capacities and replace aging facilities, decisions that we make today will have long lasting consequences for climate action. Uh, not just our internal thinking of uh, SDGs, no, uh, as the available funds for addressing climate change are currently and will continue to be substantial in comparison to the resources for sanitation investments, it is important that we consider sanitation within the context of climate adaptation and mitigation. Greater awareness of the connection between sanitation and climate change will help us facilitate opportunities to leverage sanitation related climate finance and should lead to sector investments that include meaningful consideration to climate change. So I, I think uh, this is something, is the next uh, wave of, of work uh, for us, at least at the bank. And we want to thank you for joining our session and we invite you to join us uh, as we raise awareness to these issues. Thank you so much. Thanks, Maria Angelica. Uh, thanks to everyone again. Thanks for the um, um, to the presenters and for the really nice chat that's been going on and, and the great ideas. And let's take Natalie's suggestion and let's let's create a lobby. Let's do the advocacy and let's move this um, let's move this discussion, this important discussion, forward for for the sanitation sector. Um, see you at the next session. Thank you and goodbye for now. <laughs>